the thing that most publishers and editorial based sites are learning now is owning your own relationship with the audience you know owning your own kind of content building those archives is really the only way that you can genuinely do long-term success Hi, I'm Neil Perkin, the host of Think with Google Firestarters. And uh, Firestarters for the Uninitiated is a series of insightful conversations with the interested and interesting of the advertising, marketing, content, and innovation communities. And today, I'm lucky enough to be speaking with Matt Locke, uh, who is the founder and director of Story Things. Uh, and they're a content marketing agency. On the website, they say they're the content marketing agency of choice for some of the world's most forward-thinking B2B brands and organizations. Uh, but Matt has some fascinating thoughts on uh, content and content marketing. So Matt, welcome to Firestarters. I'm gonna ask you, um, if I may, uh, you've been posting recently five rules to succeed in the new era of content discovery, uh, which I just think are brilliant. And I'd love to ask you specifically about those five rules, if I may. So over to you, Matt, just talk us through those five rules. Yeah, sure. So thanks very much for the invitation. Um, always a pleasure to, to come on your podcast. Um, so yeah, we developed these rules because a lot of our clients, uh, we work a lot with big global brands. We work with people like ADP, we've worked with Experian and Pearson in the past, and a lot of foundations, people like Bill and Melinda Gates, Rockefeller Foundation, people like that. Um, and really what they're trying to do with their b2b comms is something beyond the the kind of programmatic um you know kind of click campaigns that that digital has made so effective over the last 10 years or so there are a lot more about you know really developing deep brand positioning and that's something that's always been quite tricky for people in digital people haven't really understood what what great brand positioning means and so what we wanted to do was to take some of the stuff that we'd learned from running you know really long campaigns for people over time um, and write that up into a way that's really capturing some of that key insight and key value. So a lot of the stuff we do for clients, as I said, is, is really about the long term. It's about being in the long game and building a kind of corpus of content that means that you are providing genuine value for your audience. Um, and this long game is really quite tricky now. You know, an awful lot of marketing and comms agencies um, and comms departments are being measured on, you know, monthly quarterly or even weekly campaigns um and so it requires a certain amount of positioning to be able to go to your 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 stakeholders and your your kind of peers and your organization and say actually we want to build something over the long term but we've seen that that really works and we've seen that that kind of long-term view really works so we wanted to kind of give people a couple of rules that help them understand that so the first rule is really focusing on audiences not platforms when you're building something for the long term Platforms are obviously a really, really important part of how we can reach our audiences now, but they are not in your control. They are not something that you necessarily can decide how you reach your audience on that. So algorithms can shift and change and the platform kind of, of features and functionalities can change. So when we talk about building long term value for clients, we really, really focus on audiences and understanding their behaviors, because at the end, what we're trying to reach is the people behind the platforms, the people who are on their phones, on their laptops, you know, kind of looking for information, looking for stuff that they value, and really trying to understand who they are and what they want. So when we start work with a new client, we don't start by thinking, is this your TikTok strategy? Is this your kind of paid search strategy? We start by thinking, who are the people you're trying to reach and what does their day look like? Like, what are you competing for in terms of attention? So we have a model which we call the attention pattern spectrum um, at Story Things, which really looks at how particularly since 2007 on mobile phones, every single moment of the day is a potential media moment. And so really what you're trying to think of, the first question you're asking yourself when you're reaching your audience is where is this gonna fit in? Like how on earth are you gonna find a moment of the day when somebody can give your attention their content? And particularly for B2B, because I think that people somehow feel that there is a mode of work that people go into where they're like, yes, I will sit down and read your 30 page PDF report. You know, like that's actually something that people do. Yeah. In reality, every single moment of a day, we're competing with Netflix, we're competing with the social platforms, we're competing with, you know, kind of live sports, we're competing with all those things for people's attention, particularly in a hybrid workforce as we are now, you can't just, you can't take for granted the fact that people will give you the, your attention because you're reaching them in a business in a business context. So we do a deep kind of research into not just 
demographics or personas of audiences, but deep research into the behaviors. Like what do they know to do? What kinds of behaviors around things like subscribing, following, you know, committing to content are they uh, familiar with? And what are the triggers for them in doing that? What kinds of things are they subscribing to? So we do a, a, a kind of format sometimes on Attention Matters called subscribed, sh shared, and followed. And we're really interested in that. Like, what is it that makes you subscribe to something? What is it that makes you share something? So they're the kind of behaviors that we get into. And if you can be curious about your audience and their behaviors, you're far more likely to understand how you can reach them um, across lots of different platforms. And if you just focus on the algorithm for this or that. So that's the first one, really, really going deep into your audience. The second one linked to that is thinking about the value propositions, not the brand. And again, this is about really thinking audience centric. Um, and we use the value proposition canvas a lot in, with clients, which comes from the uh, strategizer, the company that does a business model canvas. And we really love that because it forces you to think in from your audience rather than out your audience. A lot of us, when we're thinking about comms, again, particularly with B2B, we're thinking about what do we want to say to people? What messages do you want to send? Rather than thinking, what do they need? Like, what is the information? What is the value that they need that only we can provide? So the value proposition work is thinking about what are the pains or gains that your messages can 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 kind of offer. So what, what can you help them with? Or what kind of things can you take away? Or what can you do that makes them feel extraordinary? What is the value that only your brand can bring? Um, because if you don't get that value proposition right, the chance of getting attention goes down exponentially. Um, there's a great subset called Category Pirates that we love at Story Things. Um, and they write very, very long emails, uh, business-related emails. and. Uh, when somebody said to them, well, aren't attention patterns getting shorter? They said, no, attention patterns are actually can be really long, but consideration patterns are getting shorter. So the amount of time that somebody takes to decide whether to give you their attention is very short. So if you don't get that value proposition right, if you, people don't understand why this is going to mean something for them, then they're just going to kind of like move on to the next thing. So that's really important for us, that distinction between thinking that attention patterns are shorter and consideration patterns are shorter, because we definitely think it's the latter more than the former. That's, I mean, it's, what's really interesting about those, the way you've talked about the first two there is that the common thing for me is about thinking about working back, I guess, uh, you might call it, working back from your understanding of uh, of your customer or, or its behaviors uh, in the sense of not only with the content that they might be interested in, the content they're consuming, but also about their what they're actually doing, what they yeah. know, what they're interested in, um, and in a much sort of broader sense. So. Do you think it's really valuable, therefore, for content marketers and for marketers in, in general, obviously, to, to really just think much more broadly about customer behaviors and needs? Yeah, I think you can start by looking at yourself. I mean, I, I think we, we kind of feel that if you really zoom out and look at the impact that digital has had on us as audiences over the last 30 years, really, it's taught us to do two things that we didn't do before. So the first thing it taught us to do was search. And that's really like other behavior. It's really, really difficult to kind of underestimate how important that behavior has been to everything that we do every day. Like if you were in the late 90s and you were typing a search request into a database more than like three or four times a day, you were probably working in a library um, or a research center. But we now do it, all of us do it, you know, dozens of times a day. So that that behavior change of everybody being able to search has fundamentally changed the way that we tell stories, fundamentally changed the way we think about audiences, you know, all of that kind of stuff. The whole SEO kind of industry has come about that audience behavior. The second change that we think has happened since 2007 is we've all learned how to schedule. And the one thing I learned when I went to the BBC and Channel 4, um, coming from a digital background, not a TV or radio background, when I joined the BBC in 2001, the really interesting thing for me is that the most powerful people in those organizations were not the talent or the executives, it was the schedulers. Like deciding whether to put a show out at eight o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night could make the difference of millions of viewers because they controlled our attention for us. The schedulers controlled when we saw stuff. That control has diminished hugely since 2007, since the rise of mobile phones and then VOD platforms. And now what the other behavior we've learned as audiences is we've learned to make decisions about how we schedule our attention. We, we, we see stuff coming at us all the time and we make conscious decisions about no, I'm not interested. Yes, I'm gonna save that. Yes, I'm gonna to subscribe to that. We make thousands and thousands of micro decisions every year about the content we want to commit to. That's what you're designing for, that first kind of moment of contact with the audience where they have to make a decision whether to schedule you into their attention pattern or not. That's basically the problem that we all have is like, what is it and how can we understand the factors that are driving that decision to give you that, that consideration moment? That's the real problem we all have these days. 
And you mentioned, I mean, in the, the way you phrase this kind of second rule is focus on value propositions, not your brand. And yeah. obviously, most marketers would think, well, what, as a brand, what have we got to say? What's our positioning as a brand? So what, what's the difference between that and actually thinking about your value proposition? Well, I don't, even if you have a very, feel like you have a very strong brand, if there isn't a value proposition as well, if, somebody, if, it, if somebody's not going to see your message and think, oh, yeah, I have to do that because it's something that's valuable to the project I'm doing or this is an interesting product or service that actually I'm researching at the moment or that's a brilliant piece of insight or data that I can't get from anywhere else. If there isn't that thing there, then the fact that it's a brand that you like doesn't mean anything. Like if there's no value proposition there, we've, none of us have got enough attention to give to messages just because we love the brand. You know, even I'm a big Spurs fan. So if you can think about the things that you genuinely, the brands that you genuinely have a commitment to, you know, I've loved Spurs since I was eight. There's a photograph of me aged eight um, holding the FA Cup in 1981 above my TV. You know, I am a big Spurs fan. But even then, there's an awful lot of communication they give to me that I just don't pay attention to because it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, I don't want to join Socios. I don't want to join a digital part of the pitch. I'm not interested in this campaign. I'm not interested in that thing. There is no value for me there. Um, so even for brands that we feel like we have affinity with, or if brands feel that they have customers that have an affinity with to them, unless you're thinking about that value proposition every single time, it doesn't mean you're going to get attention. So the brand alone is not enough. There has to be the value proposition at the same time. And you talk a, a bit just to um, before we move on to the third one. Um, you talk a bit about curate, create, and convene. Um, yeah. as, as a way of thinking about different approaches to to content. Well, so there's the three really simple value propositions for comms campaigns in particular. So if you think about the things that we have to deal with when we you know, manage our attention and schedule our attention, there is too much stuff. So one of the easy ways to create value for your audience. So we think about if you are thinking about creating content for your audience, there are basically three strategies. You can curate content, so you can pull together lots of different data and present it in a way that create that creates value because you're saving time. So we used to produce a magazine for um, an online uh, publication for Gates Foundation called How We Get to Next that was all about diverse drivers for innovation kind of globally. And each month we would focus on a subject. So we had the future of food, we had one on Afrofuturism, we had one on disability futures, we had one on kind of education, you know, lots of different subjects. And we had a team of free editors who were researching and commissioning writing based on that. And when we did the first one, they said, actually, we've got all of this research. Why don't we just publish our reading list? And like, here's a list of all the stuff we found, videos, books, articles, you know, kind of resources, stuff like that. And so every month we publish this reading list. And we've been doing this for a couple of years. And then we did uh, some audience research. And we said, you know, if you subscribe to this, we had about 50,000 subscribers on Medium at the time to the publication. And we said, you know, what is it you value? And we were quite surprised that actually those reading lists were the most valuable thing. And we heard people say stuff like, I work in cultural research. If we get a brief through that kind of covers one of your subjects, I go and look at your reading list. So that curation job, that job of actually bringing, you know, smart curation is a really, really, really valuable thing. We've been running a Friday newsletter called Story Things. that had 10 links to kind of creative inspiration for, I think we've been doing about eight or nine years now. Um, and, you know, we know that a lot of people get real value. So that's the first thing you can do is you can save people time by being a smart curator. The second part is you can create. You can tell stories, provide data that nobody else can. So as a brand, what stories can you tell that nobody else can at all? So we work for ADP, big global payroll client. And we run a quarterly for them called Rethink Quarterly that tells stories from the human side of payroll. So their audience are people who are running global payroll for companies that are operating sometimes in like 30, 40 different countries. Um, so they're huge technological challenges, but also there's really different stories about what payroll means. So the first quarterly we did for them was all about remittances. We found out that for some countries, um, remittances, money sent by migrant workers back to their home country is actually more than global aid to that country. So in other words, there are more people sending money home, more of the GDP is represented by, you know, ex expat workers sending money home than it is by actual global aid. And in some countries, GDP, more than 50% of the GDP is remittances, is money being sent back. So we kind of went deep into that and we told the human story of payroll. We told what it feels like for people who are basically relying on payroll to kind of keep their families together, to kind of, you know, 
basically live their lives. And that's what we do every quarter for them. And that's the story that only ADP can tell because they're a truly global payroll company. They don't just have a piece of software, they have people on the ground. So when we're researching articles, we're talking to their, their teams on the ground in each country that really know what payroll means for people. So that's an example of creating where you can tell stories that none of your competitors can. And we really think that those kinds of projects are a really significant competitive moat. If you can be the kind of sector superstar for your sector, if you can kind of build an audience telling stories that nobody else can, then you're in a really strong position that your competitors will find really difficult to challenge. And then the last one is convening. And actually, the ADP uh, publication we do is tied around an annual event they do, which is like the event for global payroll execs. Um, so convening your audience together and getting them to kind of feel like they're part of a community is the third way that you can create values. So yeah, if you're starting to think about the value you can create, starting with these those three ideas, what can you create, curate, what can you create, or what can you convene, is a really good way of starting to think about value propositions. Okay, so, so let me ask you about the third, the third one, because we've had uh, focus on audience, not platforms, focus on value propositions, not your brand. The third one is quite interesting because you talk about focus on niches. Yeah. Uh, which is quite um, anathema, I would say, to a, a more kind of traditional approach. You're trying to build a big audience and um, and really sort of uh, try to build scale. Um, well, so yeah. why, why niches? Well, I think there's two parts to this. The first is is very strongly linked to value proposition, which is if you're trying to do something for everyone, the chances are it's going to be less interesting to everyone. Like if you're trying to cover a very, very broad set of needs, it's going to be harder for you to create real value for uh, individuals. So we always think that starting publications with a really, really strong insight into a relatively niche need is much better than it is by starting with a very broad thing. Like, yeah, we want to reach all of our customers um, every week. It's like, well, okay, you know, why? Like, what is it you're going to do for them that's really, really important? So first of all, understanding a real need or value automatically means that you're thinking about a niche. Um, so you're thinking about stuff that is very, very specific to, to a particular community and a particular value proposition as well. So the first thing is, you know, niches are really about value propositions more than anything else. It's less about, I would not never build a, a niche audience profile based around pure demographics. I would base them around needs, like who needs this? And that need might be actually broader than you think. And that's often the case. If you build something around a very, very strong audience need signal, the chances are that more people will have that need, and sometimes across sectors that you didn't predict. So sometimes people have a need that you really, really wouldn't expect, and that's that's kind of interesting. Um, so, for example, with with Gates, we were doing this publication thinking we were very much aiming at a development, international development audience, and actually the value we provided via the reading lists were people that worked in cultural research and marketing agencies, which we really didn't expect at all. So, you know, you can sometimes find niches that you really didn't expect. The second thing is, is that we've always said for a very long time at Story Things that actually building audiences online is more like tying niches together than it is thinking about scale. So most people think of scale in terms of how do we reach a million people? And actually, we often start by saying, well, okay, who are going to be your first 1,000 subscribers? Like, who are going to be the people that really, really want this? And how can you build from that? So we kind of say that building an audience online is a bit like making a patchwork quilt. You kind of service the needs of one small group, and then you find a group that's adjacent to them and a group that's adjacent to them. And you kind of build audiences slowly over time. And that's the hardest thing right now is that actually an awful lot of the patterns that seem to be working and the strategies that seem to be working are about committing to things for, for a long period of time and building audience slowly. And we've kind of become used to the, the kind of hyper growth that, that social media advertising in particular drove over the last 10 years or so. Um, and so a lot of us have got used to the idea that if you're not reaching millions of people straight away, then the whole campaign's a bust. And what we're really trying to do with these rules is shift people away from that thinking and saying there is a lot more value in building an audience slowly and building it through niches and building gradually scale through providing and understanding your value proposition than it is to just kind of blanket something out and get lots and lots and lots of effectively vanity metrics. And if, if I can just return to that kind of convene, uh, the kind of community bit of that, so uh, if you've got a niche, you've also got an opportunity to create some real community around the content that you might be doing. But how do you do that? How do you make the content visible? How do you make the, sorry, the community visible um, to subscribers or to people that are actually engaging with the content in a way that actually makes them feel part of that community? So I think a lot of people get really scared about the word community. Um, definitely people feel like running and managing a community is something which is going to take a huge amount of resources and that will quickly move off into an area that you're not 
interested in or controlling in. But the point is, is that, you know, a community is not all about creating a space where people hang out all day and do stuff. It's about reflecting the audience back to themselves in a way that lets them see connections. So, you know, sometimes it's just a case of, you know, referring when people do, like leaving space in your content formats for people to give you their feedback, to talk back, to kind of give you their opinion, and then just reflecting that back in the cadence of your comms. If it's a newsletter or a podcast, it's about reflecting the community back to itself. So the very least you can do is reflect the community back to itself. You don't have to host spaces in which they um, necessarily kind of come together. But just that feeling that you are part of a group of people who are listening to a format is, or you know, consuming a format is really, really good it kind of validates you, your own attention decisions it's like oh yeah other people are giving this their attention therefore that must be a good thing so at the very least you should be reflecting the audience back to itself regularly within the formats and finding creative ways to do that if you've got the kind of if you think there is a stronger value proposition in really building out that community then there are lots of different ways in which you can host it there's a great book called get together uh, produced by bailey richardson and her team who now i think they all went she was ex Instagram, and I think they all went to Substack now and work on community building a Substack. But it was a great book published by Stripe Press, um, which basically gives you a kind of roadmap for building community in lots of different ways, both online and offline. And although not all of it will be appropriate to people building communities around B2B brands, we've actually used that framework with our clients to think through how different content products support that idea of community in different ways. So it's a, you know, building and kind of engaging community is a really complex thing. But it can be as light touch or as deep as you want it to be. It doesn't mean, oh, my God, we're going to have to create a Discord and somebody's going to have to be on the Discord all the time and going to have to kind of, you know, uh, moderate it and all that kind of stuff. You can build quite light touch community. And community could be something that you invoke at various points. It doesn't have to be something you're involved with all the time. So annual events and stuff like that. Or I used to run an event called The Story every year, which we did for 10 years. Um, and that really felt like a community, but actually it only really happened in the kind of weeks leading up to the event and then the, a few weeks afterwards. So it wasn't like we were running a community around the story the whole year. It was just around the event. So, but it's about creating that kind of, you know, call and response with your audience, like creating moments where they feel like they are being recognized and seen and they can feel that they are valued as members of a community around your, uh, around your communications and your content. Brilliant. Um, so let me ask about the fourth one, because this, I think, is a particularly interesting one. Uh, so the fourth one is build content formats that become habits. So yeah. the idea of content being a habit is a really interesting idea. I'd like to dive into that a bit more. Can you tell me a bit more about what you mean by that? So this is this kind of links back to the first couple again in that, you know, we are our own schedulers now. So we are, although the platforms uh, do try to kind of um, manage our attention for us in various ways with for you fees and stuff like that. Um, there are large parts of our media diet where we are making really conscious decisions that we want to come back to something, we want to follow something, we want to build a relationship with a content brand. So that might be podcasts that you listen to regularly, it might be newsletters that appear in your news box, in your inbox every day, um, it might be TV shows that you're, that you're viewing, you know, there is a large amount of our attention which are very conscious decisions that I find this valuable, I want to kind of build a relationship with it. And I think if you're a B2B comms person in particular, this is really essential because as everyone knows, the rules about B2B buying is that at any one point in time, 95% of your customers are just not buying. You know, it might be that there's a procurement process, it might be that it's a kind of thing that happens every three years, but you know, even if they're interested in your brand and your products and services, they are probably not going to be buying at the point in time that you are sending that one-off campaign. So building a habit and building a regular touch point with your audience is all about salience. It's all the classic kind of Byron Sharp, how brands grow thing, about being front of mind, about being available at the point where somebody is making a purchasing decision. So for us, building something that becomes a habit is not just about kind of, you know, looping them into a, a paid subscription relationship. It's about creating a cadence of, you know, People value the stuff, you know, you're providing that value proposition, they value you enough, they've decided to make a commitment to you in whatever form that is, maybe it's like a season of a podcast, maybe it's a regular weekly newsletter, maybe it's an annual event or whatever. But if you've got that cadence where they think about you as part of their habit, like their media habit, then you're in a really strong position to be front of mind when they're in the position to make a buying decision. Whereas if you're just doing one-off campaigns, there is no habit building there. There is no, you know, you get people's attention, but then it just disappears again. So for us, building habits is partly about 
building something that's valuable enough that people make that decision to actually commit to you and for us the highest measure of engagement is how many people are waiting for your next thing like how many people want to listen to your next podcast want to read your next email want to go to your next event you know what is that kind of you know latent need and desire in your audience um, and if you can build that habit, then that's the most valuable relationship you can have because you will stand a much greater chance of being front of mind when they come to a, a purchasing decision. See, I mean, you might expect that if you were to try to measure that, um, you might expect that um, typically you might measure things like time watched or return visits or number of subscribers, stuff like that. But um, how do you measure how how many people are actually looking forward to your next episode? So I think that partly comes out of those more qual metrics of having that conversation with people and talking to them and and just regularly doing kind of very, very informal audience research, like asking people, like, what value do you get out of this? You know, what, what kind of things do you appreciate? Like, just asking them what they like. So, I mean, we... With the Story Things newsletter, occasionally we'd get people talking about it on LinkedIn or, or used to get it on Twitter, a lot less so now because Twitter's really not working for anyone. But um, particularly on LinkedIn where people would say, oh, I know it's the weekend when I get the Story Things newsletter on a Friday. That's like their signal for like, okay, I can start to think about stopping work. I'm going to go through these really cool links. I'm going to get some inspiration and that's going to take me into the weekend. So, you know, sometimes you can ask people like, where do we fit into your lives? Like even if you publish a podcast on a certain day or send an email newsletter on a certain day, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to consume it then. People might save you for, you know, they might save you for a run they do on a Sunday or something like that. And those are really interesting questions to ask. It's like, well, actually, where do you, you know, where do you engage with us? Like where, where in your day do we fit? And what role do we play in, in your day? And why do we, why do you do it like that? Like what value is it there for you? And then what do you do afterwards? Do you share it? Do you kind of like, you know, post it on a work Slack, like what do people actually do with it? So I think getting curious about that question, where do you fit into people's lives is, is just as important as measuring those, you know, automatic database metrics like time watch, stuff like that. You kind of want to get underneath that and ask and find out like what are the conscious decisions, you know, if people are their own schedulers now, if they are managing their attention, what is it about your thing that they really love? Because they're the kind of insights that are going to help you grow your audience and help you understand the the, the role you might play in other people's lives. Um, I love that thought about um, the kind of associations that you might have with particular content or content formats, like a podcast that you might listen to every week in the gym or, you know, like you say, you get a newsletter on a Friday, so it's the weekend, whatever. Uh, I love that thought. Um, one thing um, to move on to the kind of fifth um, rule here, you talk a bit about building your own archive. And I guess this relates um, back to where you began, which was about long term versus short term. Yeah. and the long-term value that you can create from content. So let's move on to that. Talk a bit about what you mean by this idea of building your own archive of content. I think this is this is all tied into that value proposition thing. But what we found a lot, particularly with things like podcasts and newsletters, is that when people discover you and realize that you're something that they value and they want more of, the first thing they do is they look for your archive. They look for more. They kind of go back and listen from the start or they kind of like dive into, into previous emails and stuff like that. So there is a real value in having, like we call it about increasing the surface area of your brand online. Like if you genuinely have a large archive of really, really great content that you've built up over time, you are creating more value from the get-go. You know, you are building something that's valuable for lots and lots and lots of future audiences who are gonna find you and discover you. Um, so at the very least, building an archive is about thinking, right, we're going to build a part of the web that search and other sources are going to look at and think, I mean, particularly with Google changes to, you know, helpful content, archives are a really big part of that. You know, one-off campaigns or kind of fly paper SEO content just doesn't get picked up by Google nearly as much. If it looks like you have been doing something for a long time and you're authoritative on it, then your SEO is going to increase a huge amount. And that's, that's a kind of long game, but it's the game, again, it's about building that competitive moat. As part of all of this kind of new rules, we talk about the idea of being sector superstars. We genuinely think that there is a shift in content marketing that's beginning now, that's moving away from kind of pay-per-click campaigns into these kind of longer, more uh, long-term value-driven ideas. And it's a bit of a race. Like basically, for in each sector, there are going to be maybe three or four brands who are going to genuinely create content formats which are valuable enough and build archives over time that mean that they become the sector superstars they become like the people in their sector like adp is with the rethink event you know they are the thing that everyone has to go to or everyone has to follow or subscribe to 
So if you do that, and if you have a long archive of, of content created by doing that for a long time, it's so much harder for somebody else to take that equity than it is with a one-off campaign. You know, somebody can always do a flashier campaign, you know, a kind of cooler ad. They can kind of understand the algorithm a bit better than you. But nobody else can do the work that you've been doing for five, ten years if you've been doing that. You know, it's that classic saying of, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The second best time is now. You know, start building your archive now. Start thinking about where you want to be. One of the things we ask our clients when we develop a new format for them is what's it going to feel like when you're doing the 100th edition of this format? Like, what will it feel like for you? What would it mean that you can do? Because the other thing with archives is you can use them to create additional value. So we've been running Formats Unpacked, which is a, a newsletter that we look at different formats every week and we unpack what makes them special. And we've been doing that for around 100 or so formats now. So Hugh is currently, my co-director, is currently going back through them all, picking out the patterns. So like, what have we learned about different kinds of formats? And what have we, what kinds of things have we discovered that we can extrapolate and tell new stories about that now we've got an archive of over 100 formats? So once you have that kind of content archive, you can start going back and creating new content with it in a way that and get insights from it that other people can't because they haven't committed to it they haven't committed to doing that thing for long enough to generate those kinds of insights so this really is all about building that competitive moat through your content and creating a, a large surface area where people can discover you in lots and lots of different ways yeah it's nicely put i mean i think we used to talk about um, evergreen and ephemeral content yeah. uh, years yeah, yeah. back which was about the idea of uh, you know ephemeral content being uh, it's kind of here one minute uh, gone the next you know driven by social feeds uh, evergreen content being the kind of content that does stick around and, and is useful as a resource for the long term are you basically saying that you think that evergreen content is undervalued there, there, there's not this kind of I think, um, so. I, think, I, think I think I think I mean people call it stock and flow as well there's been a number of different ways in which people have described it I think particularly you know as performance-based marketing you know just seems so effective people kind of didn't it was harder for people to say actually we're going to commit to something and create value over time because people were just you know you were competing against people that were saying yeah you know we can basically iterate a campaign over two weeks and basically you know drive people to this sale and i think if you're looking at one click sales definitely if you're looking at direct consumer goods if you're looking at that kind of b2c stuff you know that kind of effectiveness is really difficult to to argue with you know if, if if the if the decision that you need at the end of a campaign is somebody to make one click and buy then performance-based marketing is really really effective but if the thing you're trying to do is deeper if you're, if you're trying to kind of really create a trusted brand if you're if you if you're positioning yourself as the leader in your sector if you're trying to kind of position yourself in an area that's really complex where the buying purchasing decisions are, are based on lots and lots of really complex things that aren't just about a click or a lot of the work we do for foundations is a lot about change and about policy change and, and and kind of education and stuff like that they're not the kind of things that you can do with one click at the end of an instagram ad um you know you've really got to take your audience on a journey and really make them feel like they are kind of learning and growing with you on a longer journey if you want to do that then you know building archives and, and longer form content formats are really the only way you can do that you just can't do that through social media based performance campaigns so yeah i think we've been in an era in which those you know the effectiveness of pay-per-click has been so strong that it's been harder to get longer content formats away but i think that's been changing for a couple of years and i think particularly with the demise of, of twitter and, and and things like that it's really coming home to people now that you need to build a part of the web that you own and that you control you know i think it's becoming more and more important that people basically you know build their own websites and build their own archive and have destinations which are genuinely valuable for audiences um, because it's harder and harder to have a pure distribution-based strategy. It's interesting that BuzzFeed, who are really the kind of poster child of, of a pure third-party distribution strategy, recently one of their execs said, actually, we think that, you know, not only is that distribution-based strategy not effective, it's possibly even a negative thing for their brand, and they really should have focused on building, you know, the thing that most publishers and editorial-based sites are learning now is owning your own relationship with the audience, you know, owning your own kind of content, building those archives is really the only way that you can genuinely do long-term success. So we're really carrying over a lot of the things that we're learning from our backgrounds in, in TV and media and film and, you know, our backgrounds in working with editorial brands and saying to B2B clients, you know, this should be your um, strategy playbook as well. This should be where you're thinking about going. So I mean, there's so many nuances to what you're saying there, and um, so, so many different useful things to to talk about. But 
if you were a marketer um, taking over a brand, say, and you really want to ramp up the role of content within marketing, where would you start? Um, what would be the kind of process that you go through in order to uh, apply well, that thinking? I, I think it's all about audience and value proposition. I think it's like it's not really about saying, oh, actually, we think that a podcast is the right idea or not, because it might not be. You, you know, it's impossible to be too curious about your audience. So a lot of us carry with us heuristics about what we think our audiences do, do where we fit into their lives, the value we bring for them. And a lot of them are in assumptions. They might be institutional assumptions. There was a great piece of research by Neiman Lab, the uh, journalism um, industry site, a while ago where somebody basically went into newspapers and said, who do you think your audience is? And they kind of categorized a number of different ways in which people thought about the audience. In some cases, it was an institutional model, like, oh, a Daily Mail reader is X, which had been built up over years of understanding like who, are, who our audience is. In some cases, it was based on audience research. In some cases, actually, it was based on what the editor thought the audience was, or in some cases, the journalists saw their peers as their audience. So there's a, always a joke that you can tell when generations of journalists come through because they all start writing new pieces about having their first baby or buying a house or stuff like that. They kind of think of their peers as their audience. So even in a publication like a national newspaper, there are these different ideas and images of who your audience is. So the first thing I would do in your brand is just ask around your peers, like, who is our audience? Like, who are we building from? Why do we know that? Um, and if there are questions that you feel aren't really being answered properly enough, then go and do some research. Uh, you don't have to go and commission, you know, kind of six-figure audience research pieces. You can just start by asking some existing clients or asking some people that you work with. Uh, there's a great book called Just Enough Research by Erica Hall, which is our kind of Bible about doing audience research, because just the title alone is really freeing. It's like just enough research is enough, like a little bit of really good qual research is enough to get some insights from you don't have to always go and you know go to YouGov and commission a kind of 20,000 people panel survey you can just ask some questions even starting by yourself and thinking would I subscribe to this would I do this like the thing we're asking our audience to do would I really do that so I think absolutely being hugely curious about your audience and really understanding that value proposition or where you start from so if you don't know who you're trying to reach and what their behaviors are and if you don't know the value that they're looking for the problems that you can solve for them then any content format development after that is going to be less effective you know it has to come from an insight into the audience and it has to come into an insight about a value proposition Brilliant. Um, Matt, that's been absolutely fascinating. So uh, thank you so much for your time and, and for your insights there. And um, uh, do subscribe to the Story Things newsletter. It is very good. I, I get it every week. But um, thanks again to Matt. And if you are enjoying this episode of Fast Starters, don't forget to subscribe and to share the episode, of course. So thank you very much for uh, joining us today, Matt. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invite. Lots of fun. <laughs>